So we kind of talked a little bit about this last week. But this is really what we're going to do today for real, so we might as well talk about it a little bit more. Um, the ABO system is the basis for everything that we do in blood bank. It was the first system that was identified, and so based on um, its biochemistry and a lot of, of the happenings that you find, in the ABO system, it kind of applies or actually contrasts in some in some ways to the other systems that we're going to learn about as we proceed through how we handle blood banking. Um, okay, there we go. So basics, immunology. You're constantly being exposed to foreign substances, the pollen in the air. The dust mites, whatever, whatever things that your, your immune system is constantly being exposed to that your body does not see as self. The sugars that the A and B antigen system, which is inosine, lactosamine, and D-galactase, are very, very common. So you find them in a lot of places, your GI tract. And so by virtue of not having the antigen, you have the antibody. It's the one and only system that you can say that about. That's not true of any other system that we're, we're going to learn about. Uh, the foreign particles are antigens. They're carbohydrates. They're proteins. They're countless ones on the surface of the red cells. We know about uh, a lot of them because we know about the antibodies. People make antibodies, so we know the antigens exist. It, a lot of times we don't know about um, a lot of the antigens because most people have them, and so you don't run into the antibody. Or very few people have them, and you don't run into the antibody. But that's usually how how we identify one. Okay. Um, don't write through all that. If it's going to elicit an immune response, it's going to be an antigen. That's what it's called. And the proteins that are produced as a result of being exposed to the antigens are called antibodies. So basically, what happened over time, they, you have to kind of put yourself in a mindset where back when George Washington the time, they didn't think so much about giving blood. They thought about blood letting, so they put leeches on them and took the blood out because it was bad blood. And then some, something happened that people started thinking, well, maybe we need to stop taking the blood out. Maybe we need to start putting something in. So they tried different measures. And if anybody's interested, interested, I've got a giant long history of different things that were tried over, over time and, and sort of responses that they, they had. Um, but they, they tried goat's milk. But obviously goat's milk probably didn't do very well. Um, and probably came up with all kinds of other problems for the person. They tried using sheep's blood. Sheep's blood was very, very common for um, a while. I don't know whether sheep's blood actually helped anybody. They may have gotten better on their own, and the sheep's blood was there, and it's all kind of serendipitous. But they did try sheep's blood. They tried other types of blood. What was very common is they would pull somebody in off the street and say, come here. And they put a needle in one guy's arm, put the needle in the other guy's arm, and they just pump some blood in to the other person and say, how do you feel? And if they felt better, they'd give a little more blood. And if they didn't feel so good, then they'd stop and go find somebody else. And so that's how transfusions sort of occurred over time. Uh, I, I always think about, there's a, 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 a vampire movie. I don't remember exactly which one, but there's a vampire movie where they actually do a transfusion like that. And it's always, always go, oh, how cool is this? <laughs> They're going to do a transfusion. Because, you know, Angelique or whoever the, the person that the vampire is draining of blood, they're going to give her some blood back and, oh, they're going to give her a transfusion. Oh, yay. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun to find the, the flaws in, in literature and movies and things. Anyway, 1901, Leah Steiner discovered that there were three basic blood types. He basically took people's blood and mixed it together and found that some people's blood mixed together caused a giant clump. 
or hemolysis, or both. And sometimes you mix it together, and it stayed perfectly fine. So he called it A, B, and Z. Over time, they discovered there was a fourth, which actually was a combination of A and B, and turned out to be A, B, and C ended up being O. Now C, aka O, is not really a blood type. It's the lack of the A and B sugar. So it's an amorph. And so the O just kind of gives you a, a null and void kind of a feeling as far as what your blood type is because you don't have a sugar hanging off of it. It doesn't react with our antiferum. Um, the blood antigen, group antigens are codominant. So if you have an A gene and a B gene, you're blood type AB. If you have A and O, you're blood type A. So um, the O is not a blood type, so you don't get an AO, you get an A. And you have to do secretor studies or genetic studies to be able to know whether, whether you are a homozygous or heterozygous expression of your A. You probably know that if you know any of your families. Blood types you probably have some kind of an idea. And we're going to do some typing later on with our blood. So we'll be able to, to see if we can figure it out based on, um, you know, what, if you know what your mother's blood type is and your brother's blood type, and try to put it in our little hundred squares and see if we can't figure out what's going on. Okay, so the, the sugars themselves are a uh, mutation on um, chromosome 9, and H is L fructose, and that is the precursor for the hemochrom, which takes us into here. H, if H is not there, there's nothing for, think of it as like a Christmas tree. There's nothing for the A and B sugars to hang from, so you don't, get, you don't type as blood type. Even though genetically you may be an A, you're going to type as an O because there's no place for that A sugar to hang from. So when you start talking about uh, the H antigen, you can make anti-H, but obviously the O people are going to be the ones that are not going to make anti-H because they're going to have the most expression of the H antigen itself. So the bomb bay phenotype is something that is very, very rare. You might see it in India or Japan. I have never seen one in 30 years, so uh, I kind of doubt I'm going to see one, but maybe I'll work a chance. So, so any chance of seeing one, I'll probably say it there. But basically, the Baumbach antitype is an amorph for the H antigen. So it's designated as little H, little H. And so no matter what genetic blood type the person is, they type as an O. And the problem is, is they don't see that H as self. So if you type them as O, and then they get um, transfused or expo exposed to, or however, through pregnancy or transfusions, that H antigen, they can make anti-H, and then you run into problems because then they're incompatible with pretty much everything. They react with everything because that H antigen is going to be everywhere and stuffed in other, in other bomb bay. So um, lots of questions are going to be asked on your licensure exam, I can almost guarantee it, because it's one of those those questions that, even though you never see it, they really like to ask questions from it. So when you're reading through it, if you have any confusion over it, let me know, because it's really not terribly difficult, but you sometimes have to grasp your, you know, wrap your mind around it. The, the antibody to the H antigen that the Bombay people make is IgG, which is significant. The anti-H that you occasionally see in, um, in A1 people primarily uh, is usually an IgM, it's usually cold reacting, and it's insignificant. So even though you may see the, the antibody in other individuals, the ones that are made not in Bombay, the Bombay phenotype is actually something that you really have giant headaches over. All right, so there's also secretions. So you have a secretor gene, and the secretor gene interacts with your A and B antigens, and the secretor gene basically says that you have the sugars in your secretions. 
if you lack the secretor gene, doesn't matter what you are genetically, you're not going to have those, those um, sugars in your secretions. So we did secretor studies. I think we talked about that the other day. We were talking about secretor secretions that we did a, a big study. All right. Let's see what else we can talk about. All right. Why am I going the wrong way? Okay, so the most common blood type is actually A or O, depending on where you are, because you you may have different pockets of people and different blood types that are skew. I don't like statistics when it comes to blood banking because truly, even though the majority of people may be A and O, if you go to Africa or Asia, you're not going to see as many A's as you will in the United States and Mexico and the northern or the, the western hemisphere. So you really have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt as far as statistics. But if we're going to stay in the United States and we're going to work in the United States, which more than likely is going to happen, the A and the O are going to be your most common types. If antibodies, you can have antibodies to the blood group systems that are immune or naturally occurring. Uh, the ABO antibodies, like I said before, is the only group that is the antithesis of what your antigen is that you're going to have the antibodies for, and that's the only system that works that way. Most of the antibodies that you have that are um, anti-A, anti-B, anti-A comma B, which is its own entity, are usually IgM antibodies. They usually like 22 degrees room temperature. Sometimes they like a little bit colder. They like to react at 4 degrees. But they generally have a very wide thermal amplitude. So they can go anywhere from probably 4 degrees to 37 degrees. Um, I might type yours, and yours may like room temperature, and mine might, might cold, and yours might be a little bit more like 28, and you might be 12. So we might have a little bit different optimal temperature, but usually there's no problem getting good reactions because the titers are always so high because you're constantly being bombarded with those sugars. And so unless you're, you're old, immunosuppressed, a newborn, have a bone marrow transplant, which falls back into the immunosuppressed, you shouldn't have any problems having those reactions fall into there. Okay. We already talked about the, the different colors of the antisera, the, the blue anti-A and the yellow anti-B. Um, when you're reading a reaction, the thing to remember is you don't want to read your reactions and put them down and then go get a Coke and go down and talk to somebody and then come back and, and read them again and write them down. You want to write them down as you read them and do your interpretation. That's something that the American Association of Blood Banks asks for people to do because it's best practice. And so that's what I'm going to ask you to do. You're going to read them, you're going to write them down. If you need to make a correction, you don't scribble. We make two lines and we initial. So even though in today's world, most of the time, your reactions are going to go directly into a computer program. They're not going to go on a piece of paper. There may still come a time that you are going to have to write on a piece of paper. And when you write on that piece of paper, it becomes a document. Computers may go down, or you may work in a place where they want everything on a piece of paper, so they have it as backup to their computer system, which is kind of inefficient, but that happens at home. Um, it could be like Shannon's, where we, we have start doing a lot of our more esoteric work. We all do that all on paper. It becomes a legal document, you don't scribble. You try to be as neat as you possibly can. Two lines and initial if you want to change it. No white out. And then, um, you know, if, if for some reason you have to make some major change, then I guess you could get a whole other four and start all over again. But that's probably not good either because then you, you run the transcription problem. Was it four plus here? And then I wrote four plus in this column over on this one. So try to try to be neat from the get-go. I'll tell you like I tell my kids when they're, they're doing their math homework. If you do it neatly the first time, then you don't have to write it on something else so that you can read it. Be good. Um, a zero is a negative reaction. So when you write a reaction down and you put a zero, everybody pretty much universally knows that that's negative. Sometimes 
I've seen where they use the equal sign. Rarely do you ever want to use one negative sign. That's just, I mean, people use dashes for things and it can get lost. So the zero is actually better practice. The equal sign being okay, the negative sign being not. When you read your reactions, and I'll, I'm going to show you when we get going here in a minute. If you read your reactions and you've got one giant clump of cells that are in your, in your tube, that's a four plus reaction. So you have four plus reaction being the strongest. You've got a zero reaction, negative reaction being the other end of the spectrum. If you've got a, a small number of pretty good sized chunks, that's a three plus. If you've got a medium sized chunks and a fair number of them, that's a two plus. And if you have to kind of look, but you can still tell that they're there, that's a one plus. Don't lament over how strong is this? Because it's really, really academic. There are some cases later on when you find out that it will matter whether you're looking at something that's three plus versus two plus. But for the most part, a positive is really what you're looking for. And we're dealing with ABOs, a positive is the most important thing that you're looking for. So don't lament, oh, I think this is a two plus, but it might be a three plus. Because really, in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to matter a whole lot. It's positive. Okay. If you're not sure if it's positive or not, that's a whole kind of a different story. But the, the whole, is this three plus or two plus, seems to hang people up a lot. And it really doesn't need to. Just do your best, your best gut feeling from the get-go and move on from there. Um, homolysis is a positive reaction. Some antibodies bind complement and cause homolysis. ABO is one of them. So you need to make sure that you look for homolysis when you are reading your reactions because that is a positive reaction. You sometimes have a titer so high that it lyses all of your cells and you don't have any cells left and you're like, wait a minute, I know I've got cells in here and there's nothing here now, but it's all much better than it started out being, in which case then you probably lost all of your cells. And so therefore you've got a four plus reaction if you have all of your cells are gone. There's I did notice that some of our specimens that we've got around are a little bit utilized. So we're just gonna have to go with them. If you start off with hemolysis, you have to look for more hemolysis. So you have to be able to, to kind of discern how much hemolysis did you start off with. It's not really a very good idea to have humanized specimens when you're doing with dealing with ABOs. It's not usually a big deal because your titer's high enough. You've usually got plenty of antibody to be able to react. You can make a good interpretation. Everybody's happy. But, you know, if for some reason it's so humanized you can't tell where your supernate ends and in your plasma or your um, cells begin, then you may have to have it redrawn. Most blood bank tests these days are done on purple or pink top tubes, which is EDTA anticoagulant. EDTA anticoagulant tends to blow your cells a little bit more, which means they all kind of stack up and they can look like a false positive. The red top tubes are serum, so there's no anticoagulant. The red top tubes historically have been what blood bank used for its testing. So when you go out into the hospital, don't be confused. If we use red tops here, and when you get there, you're using pur purple and pinks. Because for the most part, the, the way it is to go with purple and pinks, um, you can get enough cells off of a clot tube to be able to make a clean, a clean cell suspension and be able to test it. However, because of the different methodologies that are not in the tube, it, it works out better using the plasma as opposed to using the serum. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind when you're here and, and don't get confused by, by logistics as far as the color top too. 